you can start. Welcome to Bridging Voices, the podcast series of Konrad Adenauer Foundation Multinational Development Policy Dialogue. My name is Karin Jancikova and I am the Program Manager for Climate and Energy. Just next to me, you can see uh, Honorable Mr. Chayan Sinha. Um, please, could you introduce yourself and also tell us why are you here? Good evening, Karen, and I'm very pleased to be in Brussels. Uh, I am a member of parliament uh, in India, a two-term member from the Bharatiya Janata Party, which is the ruling party uh, in India. I, I have been a former minister in my previous uh, term uh, from 2014 to 2019, uh, first in the Ministry of Finance and then in the Ministry of Civil Aviation. I'm currently chairperson of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Finance and a member of the Public Accounts Committee. I represent Hazari Bagh in Jharkhand, Hazaribagh is one of the major coal producing areas uh, of India and uh, is rapidly increasing its coal production. And so I am here in Brussels uh, to take forward a number of uh, discussions that we've been having on how to forge a global climate alliance. Really honored to have you here and pleased to welcome you in autumn Brussels. And the next question then is you mentioned global climate alliance. What is it actually? The Global Climate Alliance is an effort to forge uh, a new uh, alliance between the Global North and the Global South. Uh, we all understand that we have a common responsibility to bring down carbon emissions. And of course, as I said, being from Hazaribagh, uh, which is a coal producing area, uh, the use and uh, the uh, production of coal is something that is vitally important for my constituency. Uh, and so what the future of coal production is going to be, how we think about bringing up renewables, the support that we can get from the global north in doing so. These are all issues that are very, very important uh, to my voters, but also they are extremely important for India as well. Uh, and uh, for a long time, there has been a view in the global south that if we were to proceed on a decarbonization trajectory, uh, that uh, it would not be beneficial for our economic development. Uh, there has been a view that we need cheap fossil fuels to develop. But what all the analysis and the modeling work that we have been doing recently has been telling us is that net zero is net positive. So net zero being net positive, we in the global south have to find a way in which we can get on a net zero pathway, decarbonize our economies, stop uh, over time using as much coal uh, as we are and as much uh, we are using in terms of fossil fuels. And so we have to find these uh, sustainable trajectories for decarbonization. But again, as I said, all the modeling work uh, is showing us uh, that this is going to be good for India, it's going to be good for the world. So we have to find a way in which through a global climate alliance, we can get the support of the global north to be able to get on these uh, decarbonization pathways and accelerate uh, our trajectory towards net zero. So you mentioned global climate alliance. Global means who will be the members then? The members for the global climate alliance uh, will be countries uh, that do want to uh, take on these accelerated decarbonization targets. Uh, in the global north, we have seen already uh, that whether it's the EU, uh, Canada, Australia, the UK, New Zealand, uh, these countries have already uh, made legally binding commitments uh, in their uh, parliaments uh, to get to net zero by 2050. Mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. is also committing to uh, very aggressively drive decarbonization uh, through the recently passed uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, so these uh, efforts are already underway in the global north. And so we would expect global north countries to be members of a global climate alliance mm -hmm. because uh, that will be a motivation and an incentive for members of the Global South as well. But equally, we would like members of the Global South to be a part of this alliance so that they can also benefit uh, from the support of the Global North in this. And we have a very, very important opportunity to accelerate all these discussions, Karen, because India is going to be assuming the G20 presidency uh, in December of this year. Mm -hmm. And through that... Uh, uh, presidency, we have an opportunity to put forward a proposal for a global climate alliance, 
building on the work that Germany did when it was the G7 uh, president uh, and where they introduced this idea of an open and inclusive climate club, uh, we could take forward that proposal, that thinking uh, and bring it uh, you know, to the G20 and really make it a platform for countries that want to accelerate their decarbonization efforts. Motivation element. Is there a motivation element within the, how you will convince the member states to come? Well, there has to be uh, a strong set of incentives mm -hmm. uh, for the Global South to be a member of such a global climate alliance. As I said, most countries in the Global North have already made commitments and are making very substantial investments to decarbonize. The challenge for the Global South is that even though net zero is net positive and it is better for them whether we look at it in terms of GDP, jobs, air pollution, dependency on fossil fuels, any parameter that we look at, uh, it is actually better for us to move towards net zero. But it requires very substantial amounts of capital, well beyond uh, the mobilization capabilities of the Global South. And it requires uh, a host of new technologies, whether they are battery technologies, uh, whether they are uh, green hydrogen technologies, biofuel technologies, all of these new technologies are going to be required to get onto the decarbonization pathway. So the incentive for the members of the Global South is that they will get the support of the Global North uh, to decarbonize. So that really becomes, in a way, uh, the, 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 the quid pro quo uh, that this climate alliance uh, will, will try and set up. Uh, the Global North uh, will provide support, financial, technology, policy support, all of these ways in which they can support the Global South. The Global South will benefit from that support and in, and in, in, in turn, the Global South will commit to much more aggressive decarbonization targets than they would have otherwise. So that's why people will join. The Global North will join because we all know that a world that gets to net zero makes us much safer and prevents the disastrous impact of climate change. And of course, the Global South benefits because uh, there's faster GDP growth, there's more job creation, there's less air pollution, and we get the support uh, from a capital perspective, from a technology perspective, and a policy perspective from the Global North. So it's a win-win-win. The North wins, the South wins, and the planet wins. And most importantly, Karen, our children win because, exactly. because we are able to uh, pre uh, prevent uh, you know, global warming to exceed you know, one and a half, two degrees centigrade, which is what we all agreed to during the Paris Agreement. You mentioned Paris Agreement. So what commitments the member states would need to make? What the first is climate alliance from Paris Agreement commitments the member states there did. So what, what is... What is the commitment you ask the member states? So we hope to go beyond the Paris Agreement, Karen. What okay. we would like to do uh, is we would like all member countries of the Global Climate Alliance to commit on a legally uh, binding basis to net zero targets and not just net zero targets uh, on a far off date, not just 2050 or 2060 or 2070, but to show in a very tangible and material way that they are getting on decarbonization pathways that are going to bend the curve, that are going to make a difference to carbon emissions even in the next few years. So we would like everyone to commit to some very substantial and very material targets uh, on decarbonization by 2025. Uh, and this includes both Global North countries as well as Global South countries. Now, obviously, those targets will be different for different countries, and this is part of working uh, out you know, what is required in the Global Climate Alliance. But in return for that, as I said, we will get financial technology and policy support from the Global North uh, coming in to the Global South. So that's how we go beyond the Paris Agreement, where there are very tangible commitments, both in terms of decarbonization targets and very tangible commitments in terms of financial and technology flows. You mentioned finance investments. How will the Global Climate Alliance get the financial flows necessary? You know, Karen, that uh, it's been very difficult to generate the climate finance for the Global South uh, to be able to get to net zero. Uh, we are still trying uh, to make the $100 billion that was promised in the Paris Agreement real. Mm -hmm. uh, that still uh, is not uh, coming together the way I think the Global South would like it to. Uh, so we really have to step up what we do on the financial side to make this Global Climate Alliance real. If we don't succeed on the financial side, uh, then, frankly, the Global Climate Alliance really cannot move forward. Mm. 
Now, to do that, the very important part that we do need to understand in terms of decarbonization or green investments is that the bulk of these investments, perhaps 80% of these investments, have to be in the private sector. This has to be a market-driven approach because if we are going to decarbonize power, if we are going to decarbonize steel, cement, fertilizer, aluminum, if we are going to decarbonize real estate, uh, all of these uh, will have to be done by the private sector. Everybody is going to go out and buy electric cars. They're going to buy electric two-wheelers and three-wheelers. So these are things that we have to do across the economy and largely in the private sector. So this is not a question of government-to-government -government transfers of money. This is a question of how do we mobilize the trillions of dollars of private capital that exists in this world to flow to the global south to be uh, invested in these green technologies. That's really what we have to unlock. And here, the role of the multilateral development banks, the IFC, the World Bank, uh, the European Investment Bank, the Asian Development Bank, this is very, very important because they can help in reducing some of the risks, some of the problems uh, that private capital deals with uh, when they are operating uh, in developing countries, in low-income countries. And by applying you know, blended capital instruments like first loss guarantees, like climate insurance, uh, like uh, credit guarantees of various kinds, it is possible to reduce the risks that the private sector or commercial capital has to deal with. And in doing so, you reduce the cost of capital for green investments. So today, if I had to make a green investment uh, in India, uh, you know, it might cost me 12% uh, as a rate of return to make a green investment. If I can mitigate those risks through the multilateral development banks and bring it down to 6% instead of 12%, then I can unlock a lot more private sector capital. And so that is the role the multilateral development banks have to play, and that is the support that the global north countries have to provide by scaling up the multilateral development banks, providing them more capital, and also directing them to really, really innovate and scale up these blended capital instruments. What do you see as challenge, implementation challenges? There are many implementation challenges. This is a multi-year process. Uh, we, of course, have to be able to put a robust proposal together, a proposal that takes into account many of the issues mm. uh, that are swirling around in the climate uh, debate and the climate discussion right now. The European Union, of course, has implemented uh, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, CBAM, as it's called. So the design of the Global Climate Alliance has to take into account the CBAM. Uh, we have to take into account competitive uh, issues so that uh, if subsidies uh, are available for steel companies in one country, uh, they don't make it difficult for steel companies in another country. So we've got to align policies and we've got to make sure that all uh, companies are on a level playing field in that regard. There's a third set of implementation challenges which really deal with uh, the green taxonomy and regulation uh, that goes along with that. So we have to make sure that the regulatory framework associated with green investments uh, and disclosure thereof uh, is consistent across jurisdictions. So whether it's the European Union, the US, the UK, India, uh, China, we all have to have consistent terminology for green investment. So we all know that it's, uh, it's a legitimate green investment. So regulation, disclosure, compliance, all of those issues become very, very important. And then finally, we have to mobilize the capital. So we have to be able to engage with commercial capital, with private sector investors, and make sure that you know whether it's a sovereign f uh, wealth fund, whether it is a pension fund, large mutual funds, all of them uh, do believe that it is in their best economic and fiduciary interest to make these green investments. All of these stakeholders have to be taken on board. The policy discussions uh, have to result in concrete outcomes. Uh, political leadership uh, and voters have to feel that this is all in their best interest. And so, as I said, this is a multi-year process uh, that will take time to bring on board all the stakeholders. But I have a lot of optimism about it, uh, Karen, because I have seen over the last many years how the EU with 27 member countries has been able to uh, forge the EU Fit for 55 program, which is very ambitious, uh, very wide-ranging, and is showing real results 
uh, in moving towards net zero. So the EU is a trendsetter. The EU has shown us how to do it. And we need to build on that and bring on board uh, both Global North and Global South mm. members. And that's why uh, these last two days in Brussels, uh, meeting with European colleagues, discussing with EU officials has been so useful because there are many, many very interesting learnings to be had from uh, the EU Fit for 55 program and the discussions and deliberations uh, across the EU and making this happen. As you mentioned, there are many talks happening each and every day and you are a policymaker, you're a politician, so you know how much you need to talk every day. Therefore, I'm asking, like, there have been already so many efforts which may be felt and are not ambitious enough, and that's like Rio, Kyoto, and what makes this, you believe that this can success? Why you go for it? There have been many climate agreements, Karen, you are yeah. absolutely right. There's been Rio, Kyoto, Paris, uh, and unfortunately, um, we have continued to increase carbon emissions. The, work, the world continues to warm at a, a very accelerated rate. There are three reasons why I think uh, this is going to be different, and I hope it's going to be different. First, the hour is late. Mm -hmm. It's time that we do something really dramatic and radical uh, for uh, the global uh, climate. Uh, we've got to work together. Uh, we cannot be in a situation where we end up with two and a half, three degrees centigrade global warming because that would be catastrophic. So the hour is late. We have to act. We have to act now. That's the first reason. The second reason is that uh, voters, the public uh, across many, many countries, certainly uh, in Europe, certainly in the US, uh, in the UK, in Japan, and increasingly in the global south, in India as well, you know, when I go and I uh, do talks with young people, I hear back from them their concerns mm. about what's happening to the weather, what's happening to climate, the droughts, the floods that they are seeing. So I think that the support that we're getting from the public across the world to take decisive action on climate change uh, is, is really what's pushing us uh, to act. And then the third reason, I think, is that... Uh, Senior political leaders, uh, you know, the Honorable Prime Minister, Shinanand Modi ji, uh, the Bundeskanzler, uh, Olaf Scholz, uh, President Biden, uh, senior political leaders around the world uh, do believe that it is the time to act now. And so this combination of factors, I think, is, is unprecedented. Uh, climate change is uh, something that we are dealing with every day. The public wants to move forward as quickly as possible. And political leaders also see that it is uh, in their own uh, interest, in their country's national interest, to move forward. So I'm very optimistic that uh, for the sake of our children, our grandchildren, and for our sake as well, uh, we will have very tangible and material action uh, on uh, decarbonization now. Thank you, Honorable Mr. Sinha. I have one last kind request towards you. You said net zero is net positive. Do you have any more strong messages you would like to send out now to policymakers, especially decision makers around the globe? Because we speak about the Global Climate Alliance. We already spoke about the benefits they would get if they want to join. But is there really any strong message you would like to send now to the policymakers around the world uh, to alarm them with and wake up and convince them to join the Global Climate Alliance? I think everybody is uh, very alert to uh, yeah. the requirement to move very decisively on climate change now. The good news, Karen, the good news is that net zero is net positive. It's a win-win-win uh, for the Global North, for the Global South, for the planet. So net zero is net positive. The message that I would have for my colleagues in the Global South is that decarbonization, in fact, is development. Decarbonization is development. As we think about our development plans, as we think about how over the next few decades our countries can become more prosperous, greener, more secure, decarbonization offers us that opportunity. As we transform our economies, as we make our cities cleaner, more, uh, uh, more livable, uh, as we change our transportation infrastructure and move it towards electric vehicles, that whole process of decarbonization is also the pathway to prosperity 
uh, and to sustainable development. So decarbonization is development. Net zero is net positive. The time for action, Karen, is now. I have to say, Lucky World have such policymakers as you are, Mr. Sinan, to, to speak for the younger generation, which is my kids. They always ask, Mama, what is happening? How do we act? What do people are doing around the globe to stop the warming? Why there are always so many plastics around and all the pollution? And we speak about Brussels and EU and our bubble, but I can imagine the challenges you need to face as a politician in India. So really wishing you good luck, not just saying like good luck with this initiative, but good luck to our <laughs> planet and our future generations. And hopefully this will move forward. And congratulations already now to to what you are doing. And yeah, thank you for coming and visiting Brussels, making all those efforts to make things happen and change. And thank you for being here and talking to me and answering all my questions. Thank you very much, Karen. Let's all work together for a cleaner and a greener world. Thank you for the optimistic words as well. Thank you. Okay, Mick, what do you think? Yeah, right. Good. That's why we are doing it. <laughs> That's why we are doing it. <laughs>